Hi, everyone. I am Sofia Guerra, and I'm a vice president at Bessemer. Um, as you may know, outside of our day-to-day -day investing job, we strive to provide insights to, unique insights to founders on how to build transformational companies in healthcare. And over the last four years, we've published a ton of benchmarks, both on the financial and operational data on how to build or how to learn from best-in-class businesses in our category. But we often hear one question, like how do we build a differentiated go-to-market? How do you, what is the go-to-market playbook? And obviously we can sit in our seats and pontify all day or talk to uh, partners on the provider payer side, but really what we wanted to do was let's go ask in, at a high level uh, a, a lot of folks that are making these decisions day to day on what are they thinking about today, particularly for AI, and how are they making these decisions about AI adoption. So we got the pleasure of working with Bain and AWS to do a survey of 408 executives across healthcare. And we, we really asked them high level questions about their AI adoption strategy today. But then most particularly important, we asked them about 59 specific jobs to be done. What are you doing with those jobs? How automated is it? And where in the journey are you to adopting? Uh, and most importantly also, who are you partnering with? And how are you thinking about your go forward strategy? So let me share with you a few of the takeaways from this work. But before I do that, I want to juxtapose the current wave that we're in in AI adoption with the previous digitization stage, which is the adoption of EMRs. It took over a decade to get us to nearly 100% adoption or penetration in this curve. Um, but it also took required cultural shifts and change behavior. Uh, it also required a regulatory catalyst and financial incentives for providers to want to change and adopt their pen to paper to software. But fast forward to today, only 2.5 years after the LLMs became ubiquitous for, for everyone, um, 80% of our survey respondents say that they've selected or are in the process of selecting a partner for an AI scribe. This is unprecedented and no one is paying them to do this. They're doing this because they want to change and they want to adopt this technology. So this is really exciting. So what did we do in the survey and why are we all here in the room today? Um, we want to understand where are we in the curve of adopting technology but most importantly, we want to create avenues like this room here to have conversations about how can we collaborate between startups and decision makers and buyers into how best to adopt this technology and make the most of it, make this um, a reality. So one thing is very clear from this chart is that executives are very excited about the potential of AI. They have high aspirations and high expectations for generative AI in healthcare. Particularly, we can all talk about it's gonna save us a lot in FD costs, in productivity, we can do a lot of administration changes, but most importantly, the, the high majority, so over 84% of folks, say that Gen AI will significantly trans transform how we do diagnosis and treatment in healthcare in the next three to five years. This is amazing. So this is just a quick snapshot of all of the jobs that we tested. We're not gonna go into all of these specific ones. You can see all the data in the report. Uh, but we asked the executives a lot of things like, how painful is this job? How automated or how manual is it today? Are you thinking about doing something with AI for this job or are you already doing it? What ROI are you seeing today? And who are you procuring or partnering to develop something with? And we'll, you can follow after, after this to see all of the data from that report, but we're gonna cover a little bit of it today. So if we look at where are we in the adoption for these use cases, all the way to the left is not yet started to all the way to the right, implementation and production. The vast majority um, of uh, survey respondents and projects are in the experimentation phase. So we have the vast majority of them be in the ideation and proof of concept stage. But the other really cool takeaway from this chart is that providers are leading the charge and have a lot more in POC than in ideation compared to payers and providers and, uh, and pharma. However, only 30% of these projects are getting into production and scale. Um, and again, providers are leading the way there again. We're seeing the large and mid providers are seeing over 40% of graduation from POCs to scale production. 
So it's really important to understand what are the bottlenecks to go from something in POC all the way to scaling this. Um, so then we can all address them in this room and make sure that we're really seeing the fruit of the impact that this technology can have at scale in our organizations. So if you look at the top five um, roadblocks or barriers, we see things like number one, concerns around security. Number two, we have lack of AI expertise internally. Number three, we have costly integrations at scale to make sure that uh, these tools are embedded in the day-to-day -day workflows. And number, three, we ha number four, we have issues with getting AI ready. The fifth one is a really interesting one because change behavior really only came up as a top five barrier for pharma. It really wasn't a, a top five for payers and providers. Remember the juxtaposition for EHR adoption? So that's a really a big a win in my book. All right, something else is, uh, is important to know. There's a lot of buy-in, and executives are putting dollars where their mouth is. They have big budgets, and those budgets are also growing. Um, over less than 35% of the respondents said that budget was not an issue to scale into production. And then over 60% of, of payers, providers, and pharma are saying that their Gen AI budgets are larger and growing faster than IT budgets. Another takeaway from our survey is that the C-suite is in the driver's seat for making these decisions. And this is not just for that generalized bu bucket of budget that we were talking about. This is also at the use case level. So this is really important for the startup CEOs and founders in the room to really understand how do you identify who the decision maker is for your solution and how to uh, build a relationship with those folks. And then this chart is eyesore, and so I'm not gonna go through all of the data. But I, there are a few takeaways that I want to guide you to. Um, this is the question where if you are doing something in Gen AI to it today or planning to, who are they doing it? Who are you doing it with? So what partner or development strategy are you taking for that use case? Um, the number one takeaway from this is um, across all of the use cases, only 15% of projects are being done with startups today. We see this as an opportunity, but I think that you need to understand that there's also a lot of other competition out there um, for development. Primarily, the majority of stakeholders or executives are doing this internally. There's a lot of partnerships with horizontal AI labs and technology partners to, to do internal development. There's also competition from systems of record and existing incumbents or large healthcare IT companies that are developing these future features as part of their existing um, software that already has distribution. So it's also important to understand how can you position yourself to be differentiated from the existing incumbents. So in our report, we put together uh, a playbook, go to market, and how can startups win in this environment? I'm not gonna go through all of this. I'll encourage all of the founders and anyone who's interested to read the report, but I wanna walk you through a unique um, data where we combined a lot of the takeaways from the use case, at the use case level, where are we in this adoption? And we created this cheeky <laughs> concept of the AI DX or the AI Diagnostic Index. Um, this index is composed of three different components. Number one is the opportunity score. So for a particular job to be done, what is the urgency or the need to do uh, innovation in this particular use case. So there, this is how painful is it and it's very manual today. Um, the adoption score is where in the adoption are we or the majority of folks fall into. That could either be not yet developed anything for this use case all the way to we're in an implementation and obviously there's a bunch of steps in between. And then the development strategy which is what who are they partnering with to do that development or expecting to do that development with? That could either be your system of record, that could be a startup, that could be internally. So this is important also to understand that competition um, that we were talking about. So there's a lot of numbers in this slide and really the purpose of this is really to show you that we've published a ton of data at the particular use case level. But I, let me convert a lot of this data into uh, this two by two. So for example, this is all of the use cases for providers that we tested. And on the y-axis you have opportunity. So low being, there's low opportunity because this is not a pain point or it's very automated already today. All the way to very high, it's like a high pain point and it's very manual. 
And on the x-axis, you have adoption. Uh, low being not doing anything at all today, high being we're highly adopted iron at scale with something. Obviously, we're early in the journey, so we're not seeing that many very high um, in adoption. But I like to point out the example that we talked about on AI scribes. Uh, they are high in the x-axis of adoption, but they're still seeing meaningful pain, pain point for, for documentation support. So there's still a lot of uh, improvement that we can do in how we're helping providers uh, relieve that, that pain point and uh, manual job that they're doing every day. Um, if I'm an investor or a founder or a buyer, I will read this chart very differently depending on what you want. As an example, if you're a buyer, I'm assuming you're expecting you want to be procuring for startups that have some case studies or have examples of more adoption in other customers, so you'd expect them to be maybe in the middle to right in adoption. Uh, for use cases that are a big pain point for you, so high in, in opportunity. If you're a founder, depending on where you are, you probably are thinking, I want to pick or work on a, on a problem that's high pain, high, high pain point or high opportunity, but then that's low in adoption because that means that there's going to be a lot less competition for you. Um, so you can find all of the data and all of the use cases, all the 59 that we talked about um, in, in our report as well. Uh, so we've also partnered with Bain, not to just do this incredible work on the survey side, but then also to understand how our buyers thinking and navigating in this innovation wave. And I'd love to pass it on to my friend Eric, who's going to talk a little bit about this. Thanks. So I'll be very brief, but <clears throat> we, when we partnered with this, we always had the intention of thinking about Bessemer coming at this from the startup and the founder and the entrepreneurial angle, and then when we were thinking about advising our clients who tend to be large health systems, large pharma companies, med tech companies, how are they reacting to this incredible surge in innovation, both from the startup community, from the large language models and, and AI labs that are out there like AWS and others, how do you kind of deal with those multiple concurrent waves that are kind of sweeping over your head, all in the context of the exact same data we just looked at, which is the opportunity is there, but what do you do about it? And, and I think just one page to give you an insight, particularly for the startups in the room, um, on how we would be advising our clients, because it, I think it'll give you insight into kind of the yin and the yang and how you think about uh, both sides of the coin. So number one, when we advise our clients, on how to think about AI, point number one is foster a cultureness of readiness. Readiness in and of itself is a virtue and a capability. For a long time, we heard a lot of people talking about FOMO, a fear of missing out. And, and so how do you curate a list of 50, 100, 200, 300 startups, all of whom are knocking on your door, all of whom want an hour of your time, all of whom are sending you LinkedIn's, how do you actually create a systematic way to cut through some of the clutter and identify the types of startups and the types of companies you want to partner with, the rubric to think about it. So readiness is a big virtue. You also have uh, to recognize that these companies plan on multi-year timescales. And the level of innovation we're seeing in AI now is a, a pace that they are not accustomed to planning around. Like, when we start thinking about how far AI has come in one, two, three, four years, and the fact that investments you make today are more likely than not going to be outdated in three years, when you think about juxtaposing that against investments in Epic and other things like that, systems of record that have decade-long timescales, you have to build a fundamentally new capability to wrestle with some of that AI. Point number two is going to be um, the, the ecosystem relationship. So events like this and others where you can create a curated set of people and companies and contacts that help narrow the list down. So you know of that uh, prior page, the jobs to be done, and where you're going to focus and what you're going to prioritize. What we have found over and over again in the types of conversations we have with our executive clients is this proliferation of a 1,000 mushrooms. Uh, like You have organizations of tens of thousands of people, each of whom have their own POCs and ideas. And so it actually, like anything, is going to be five to eight initiatives that really drive results. But they are all stuck, for the most part, in, in kind of 100 plus mini initiatives. And so how do you uh, get some scale? The third thing we say is that the market's moving and your competitors are moving. And so you either need to go on offense or defense. And if you don't believe that AI is a competitive advantage for you, or there's a path to making it some kind of competitive advantage, 
rest assured your competitors likely are coming to the alternative conclusion. And what does that mean for you? And so when we think about that, it's both an offensive and a defensive strategy. So where do you want to focus and prioritize? What are you going to deprioritize? And, and how are you going to react and, and, and do that? So it's been our great pleasure working with uh, Sophia and the Bessemer team, the AWS team. We hope you find the data interesting. And with that, I will hand it back to Sophia. Thanks, Eric. All right, everyone. We've covered what a high level what we were seeing in the report, but we're really excited to hear what the conversation is after this on do you agree, disagree, and what learnings or best practices do you have to share, and how can startups and buyers collaborate. Um, but uh, with that, I'll pass it and introduce my partner, Andrew Hedin, who will moderate our first fireside chat. Mm -hmm.